about the open source stewards, and it will be moderated by my dear colleague Kieran, that was so, uh, so nicely mentioned by uh, Mike. And now I would like to invite the speakers of our next panel, that will be moderated by Claire Dillon. Uh, I invite you on stage, and yeah, a round of applause. In the meantime, I will take a picture. <laughs> And as everyone's making their way to the stage, I'll, I'll invite uh, everyone to come up and take a seat and I'll, I'll briefly introduce folks, but I'll give everyone a, a chance to do that themselves. My name is Claire Dillon. I'm the co-founder of Open Ireland Network and delighted to be here today. Um, I am going to be joined by Karen Melchior, who's our MEP representative here, Gael Blondell from the Eclipse Foundation, who many of you know, uh, Peter Ganten, um, who's here from the European Open Source Business Alliance. Uh, we have Max Lemke, from the, who's the head of the unit for in, the Internet of Things at the uh, DG Connect. Um, and we also have Jean-Philippe Balancha. Balan Balanza, oh no, thank you. That's my French, it's so bad. <laughs> but delighted to have you here, Jean-Philippe, uh, who's the CEO of Smile International, but also a founding member of the European Open Source Consortium. So we're delighted to have everyone here today. Um, and as was mentioned by Mike earlier, we're here to talk about the European competitive advantage. And we've heard, and we all know here in the room, a lot about the advantages that open source brings to any uh, ecosystem, any region. Um, but I think what we're here today to talk about in this panel is about that in the context of Europe. So I'd be delighted to hear from you all now about your own perspective around what that means for you. Um, Karen, maybe we'll, we'll start with you from the, from the political perspective, if you'd like to give us your overview. Well, I've been in the European Parliament for the last nearly five years now and been trying to advocate for open source in the parliament because I really believe that this is part of having a competitive advantage for Europe because if you open up the tools that we have to build industries and software then it allows more bright young things and innovators, developers to actually use uh, the skills and the knowledge that already is there and allows people with the right ideas to succeed and not just the people that have the proprietary knowledge. Brilliant, thank you. And Gail, we heard earlier from Mike, but perhaps you can build on that and think about, from your perspective, what that European opportunity is. Yeah, sorry. With Mike. Yeah, so, yeah, what Mike described, and I think that, uh, that's very important, it's uh, what we do well and uh, what we want to do even more at the Eclipse Foundation is to, to connect uh, organizations to collaborate in open source. And I think that by collaborating in open source, they can build something that is uh, much more powerful and, and yeah, get a competitive advantage and, uh, and gain new markets. And, uh, well. Brilliant. Thank you, Gail. So, Peter, you're coming at from the commercial perspective and representing many businesses across Europe. So can you maybe talk about it from your perspective as to what you see the opportunities for open source in Europe? So I think, first of all, um, uh, in, in this era of digitization, software in infrastructure plays a similar role uh, than as, as roads and communication networks have played during industrialization. And governments all over the world realized at one point that there need to be clear rules uh, that, that everyone, every industry, every individual, every government can use this infrastructure at foreseeable prices at foreseeable conditions and at the same conditions basically for everyone. And this is not the case with most of the software and cloud infrastructure we are using today. So being the first ones realizing this and implementing another infrastructure which which, uh, which uses these rules and which is really freely available to everyone at the same rules, can even be forked and can even be run on your own, would be a huge advantage. And at the same time, we are seeing that governments and also increasingly the private sector, not only in Europe, but all over the world, asks for infrastructures which make this possible. Companies also don't want to be too much to de depend on others and s states all over the world don't want to, to be dependent. So if we are the ones who build this at first, 
this is a huge, huge opportunity for the industry in Europe. Thank you, Peter. And Max, um, Mike was talking earlier about the software-defined vehicles. I know that's a particular area of interest as well from your perspective. So maybe you can have a little uh, chat about how you think about open source in, the, in this respect. Yeah, I, I would first like to make a statement that from my point of view, open source in innovation is the opportunity for Europe to have their influence in digital innovation as communities who can only face large global players like the hyperscalers or others if they align along common objectives. So that's an important point for me, the basis. I'm not an evangelist for open source. So for me, open source is not the holy grail. Open source is an important means for reaching one of my key objectives. And that means competitiveness of European industry in a world gro with growing geopolitical tensions. Yeah, so it's, it's a means. In that sense, as a research manager with several hundred million of uh, euros investments, I promote open source as a basis for collaboration across industry, vertically, but increasingly also horizontally, meaning between competitors who compete on the market but still collaborate. And I, I have a couple of examples on that. That's an initiative, a large initiative on Internet of Things, Cloud Edge IoT, where we have a lot of research projects here. Our colleagues from Eclipse are engaged, where we use a platform approach based on open source for better exploitation, for making sure that their results are not exploited by the big ones, but also by, by themselves. And, and finally, we will also get to the Software Defined Vehicle Initiative, and a 250 million invest in 23, 24, which I have started and is now shaping. We have the money uh, basically uh, there. So there we, we get the automotive actors in Europe work together, obviously in a world market, and we, we get them basically to, to develop common building blocks in a pre-competitive environment on non-differentiating elements, so it means they all need it and they don't make the difference to the customer. We get them to, to collaborate on that in order to face uh, competition in line with competition law. And uh, we, the building blocks on software and also on hardware, open source is, the, is at the heart because that's the model they will use for their collaboration. Having said that, that's a bit what, 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 what I'm working on. For me, it's important that increased use of open source in initiatives is not an objective as such, but a means to get something done. So thank you. Well, thank you. And it's, it's wonderful to hear about these um, growing industry, I suppose, collaborations. I mean, from my own personal perspective, and there was a comment earlier about us all having to be advocates to help people understand how the open source community works. And sometimes there is a perception that open source is in the heart of the tech technology industry. Um, but when you start bringing it out into these other industry scenarios, I think that's where it makes it real and helps people understand the broader value and potential. Um, and coming to that then, Jean-Philippe, from your perspective, you're part of a consortia that operates in this space. Can you maybe talk to how you see the opportunity around open source in this way? Hi, everyone. Uh, hi everyone. Um, I knew you were uh, going to ask the question, so I had some preparation there. <laughs> and I thought um, uh, how to answer this competitiveness advantage in Europe. And I thought it was interesting to ask the private sector what they would think about it. What are the answers? What, what, how, what's the perception? What's the image of open source by private corporation? And there are very good studies that have been made uh, lately. Uh, one by Numerum, which, which is a French uh, syndicate uh, of uh, IT and digital in France. And one, one by Bitcom in, uh, in Germany. And these shed some light on what's the, 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 the perception for large private corporations in these two countries at least. Uh, and the very interesting thing is that adoption of open source is massive, massive. I mean, the, to the question, have you adopted open source uh, standards, governance and tools, plus 80% or plus 89%, depending on the, on the country. So that's done, that's accepted. And maybe to, to elaborate also on what you said, the question we get from these private corporations is no longer um, what is open source? And uh, is open source the right solution by itself? 
This morning, Omar was saying, uh, I don't need to convince you because you're all convinced by open source. Nowadays, with large corporations in Europe, there's less need to convince on open source as a vision, as a statement, as a common good. There's to convince on what is the level of sovereignty we will bring on the table, what is the usage level, what is the, the, the product quality, uh, and is it sustainable in time? This is, this is where we are, I think. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Jean-Philippe. So we've heard a little bit about your, each context, that you're, where you're coming from, and, and your goals around open source, or whether it be a, a way, a means by which you reach your goals or not. Um, so let's have a little talk about what you think about the main challenges then that are actually you know, facing us now today, the state of the nation for, for Europe, for, for actors in Europe, and how they can best, I suppose, take the next best steps to get us to these goals. Um, so Karen, you were talking about about this in the context of um, the European Parliament and the, the transparency and the opportunity there. Can you maybe elaborate on how we can take the next best steps to get to that goal? Well, I think we have a couple of pieces of legislation already on the books or nearly getting into the books on both the Data Act and also uh, the IDAS and um, the DMA looking for interoperability and creating demands on how businesses actually share knowledge with each other. And I think we need to move further along that line, but also look at how do, for example, public administrations use uh, open source technology and digitalization. Um, I was a rapporteur on a report in the URI Committee on digitalization and administrative law, where we saw that open source would be one of the great advantages for <clears throat> public administrations both at a European level but also at a national level to ensure public trust and also to reduce costs um, for public administrations. And also if we have um, a development of a code in one member state, why should this not be shared in the other member states? And that's why uh, we were calling for in the reports to have, if you have public money, you should have public code so that the code can be shared across the EU so we're not reinventing the wheel 27 times. And also looking at how each member state is doing digitalization and also encouraging public-private partnerships, which I think having open source as a foundation, as a model of working collaboratively, is crucial for this. And I'm sure everybody that's been sort of talking about Europe and digitalization is really tired of learning about Estonia, but we are not all Estonia yet. Um, and we need to learn from each other so that we can all become a little bit better. Thank you, and, and I think, uh, you know, Max, you were talking earlier about the funds available, um, but I'm just gonna do a follow-up question, Karen, if that's okay, just in terms of, you know, how, how does that happen then? Because if, if we're not Estonia yet, and presumably they've, they've learned great lessons, um, but, and, and, and these policies are coming into play, um, how do we accelerate the actual implementation of those policies within various different regions, and considering that across Europe people may be at different stages in their maturity or th towards this open source. I think we need to integrate it in, for example, the, the there's so many abbreviations in Europe. <laughs> the money that was put aside to um, re-energizing the economy after COVID, um, I think there is a lot of interconnectivity and digitalization investment in that, and trying to make open source and sharing and collaborating part of the requirements for getting that money locally. And also trying to see if we can encourage member states to act and local governments to learn from each other and collaborate. And I think using the criteria for getting the funds is a good way of encouraging this. It's always a good way of encouraging action, I think. Um, but thank you for that. Um, Gael, from your perspective, what do you think are the major challenges or the things we need to overcome to leverage this opportunity? Well, the, the opportunity is really, okay, you, we can build on top of open source and that, that accelerates innovation, that permissionless, uh, permissionless innovation, etc. So that's, that has been mentioned, mentioned before. And, and Jean-Philippe was mentioning that uh, we have massive adoption. I think that behind the massive adoption, it's also uh, at some point of time to, to contribute uh, in open source because if uh, the more you contribute the more you influence the project and the more you get uh, open source projects that really fit your needs 
And so in terms of uh, competitive advantage, uh, being a user is, uh, well, you use something that has been uh, designed by others and with their, with their own goals in mind. So European organizations, in my opinion, should really move from the moment when they adopted open source for plenty of different reasons to the moment when they, they contribute to open source and even they create their own platforms together in open source and uh, at the European level is instead of having 27 solutions or even more. <laughs> And if you think about then that step forward, moving from consuming open source into contributing, I mean, what's stopping people? Like, is it, is it, is it, is it a well, will it, or is there like a capability blocker? What, what, what do you think is there? Well, I think that's a usual learning curve that every organization has to go through the steps of uh, learning how to properly use open source, how to properly contribute to open source, and then, uh, well, how to make it uh, this competitive advantage. So that's, uh, that's more uh, where, where every organization is uh, along this learning curve. And um, yeah, it takes time and it takes developers also. Uh, Mike was mentioning that uh, we need to empower developers. And um, well, there are a few developers in the room, but I think that uh, there, there are also lots of places where uh, we mention open source, and uh, well, lots of forums where, where open source is seen as a, a good uh, tactics or a good strategy for, for our stuff, but we, we, we should keep in mind that open source is ultimately it's about code and documentation, etc. and that stuff that's, that's written by developers. So that's also how do we empower the developers to do more and, do, and how do we empower more developers or train more developers to, to write code, open source code. No, that's great. Um, though I will add to it, because I think that the opportunity is probably even bigger than developers. Not that we don't need loads of developers, we need even more of them. Um, but we probably need more people who are not developers to also understand how to contribute into the open source ecosystem. And there's probably an opportunity here in Europe to actually think about that um, from a skills building perspective, to understand about that broader ecosystem of designers and documentation writers and business folk that actually all can contribute to that e ecosystem as well. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity there. Did you want yeah, to? Maybe on, on that point of on, on build, building skills, uh, open source is really the best place to learn uh, software because uh, open source projects are sometimes not too big and you really get in touch with the best developers in the domain and that's, well, everybody should contribute to an open source project one way or another. Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the, that, that, that power of being able to learn from open source is, is something I probably didn't appreciate early enough in terms of that advantage that it brings, because if you look at how the experts do it and, and actually get to potentially even talk to the experts and build relationships with them through open source engagement, I mean, that there's nothing better than that in terms of skills building, in terms of experiential learning. So yeah, thank you for that, Gail. Um, Peter, um, in terms of, again, then, this idea of how businesses can leverage this opportunity, even thinking about the public-private partnership opportunity. Perhaps you can explore what, what you think the biggest challenges we need to overcome are. So, uh, first of all, I totally agree with everything Gareth said. Um, it is really important to engage with these projects. We went through this process uh, with the German government um, by um, suggesting to them to build an open platform where, where um, uh, administrations on the federal, on the state level, and from municipalities can engage and cooperate. And this is now the last number I've heard. It's called Open Code with DE at the end. It's now uh, used by, I think, more than 800 or 900 projects. So it's rapidly evolving. And, um, and one of the key things there was that, um, uh, th that some kind of legal certainty for, for the people from the administrations was needed. Uh, can, can, are they liable if they publish something? And all these things have to be made clear and then it started. But having said this, we, we must not forget that it is okay to just drive a car. Uh, and you, you, don't, you, you, you don't have to... Be, to engineer it always. <laughs> you, you can just drive it. And there are a lot of smaller administrations in the municipalities where we cannot expect them to become engineers, all of them, 
maybe one or two. We are lucky if they do, but, and what we see, and I think this is still a huge challenge, we see that large parts of the administration and many, many politicians have understood the advantage of digital sovereignty and open source software. But at the same time, the money is going in the opposite direction. For example, in Germany, we have still the situation that the, the, um, the, the German um, uh, uh, government, OSPO, it's called Senders, is now funded with around 25 million euros a year, or that's what we, what we expect in the budget for this year. Last year, it has have been 50 million, so it's just half of it. And at the same time, we see frame contracts with Oracle, with Microsoft, with others in the billions. And I think, at, as, and, and the, the important thing is funding research, funding development, funding cooperation is all good and is all important and I'm totally not against it. But as long as the buying power goes in the opposite direction, this will not help too much. And we need to change this too. Thank you, Peter. I know you want to come in on this, Karen? Yeah, well, I think if we're all going to be driving cars and we don't know how to open the hood of the car and understand what actually is working and how to tinker it, how to repair it, then we're going to be buying cars from somebody who knows how to build them. And if every local authority is just going to buy a car and don't, uh, aren't able to open the hood and understand how to adapt it to their purposes, then you're going to see these big tenders for big IT contracts going to big companies and not European developers. And it also is going to stop uh, people from actually developing the talent that we need in Europe. If we don't have open source available, if we don't have people being able to tinker with, with the products that they're using, uh, with the code, then we're not going to have people curious and innovative uh, learning about technology and we're going to be lack, continue to lack the tech talent that the Commission is saying that we're lacking thousands of, hundreds of thousands. Can, can I, can please, I just, please just Peter, answer just one more quick? I, yes. oh, this that, that, after that, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you there. I'm, we need that competence. But we need also framework, frame, new, new kinds of framework contracts for, which ensure that this, that this competence... I, I just need to understand. So the framework contracts, that's, we need to reform the public they, procurement they at the EU level? They, they need to require that it is open so in the end. That's, that, that is what needs to change. I do not disagree. Okay. Well, excellent. Well, <laughs> agreeable disagreement or disagreeable agreement, whichever we have, like uh, habit. But uh, please do pop yeah, in there. I think it's, um, it's a, uh, the, the procurement story is a very important one, of course, and I think there's a lot of effort that has been put in the EC to put open source as something that is needed and required. Still, there are some uh, additional moves to make, and I think that's, that's the idea. I think that we are at the moment, I, I like to take the comparison of, of Airbus to some point that there are a lot of European champions in the, in the field of open source, right? I don't say we need only one conglomerate uh, that would be a champion, but at one moment, we need to ha join forces on the market for business corporate companies to provide large projects, to be able to attract talents, build new talents, nurture talents that, and, serve, and serve the ecosystem. And how did Airbus grow, in fact? Not by subsidies as such. That's oh, the, I, I know I mean, you, if, if you... If you look I, at the know, WTO know, history, but, but, then yes. But by, but by orders, for also by orders from private corporations, to, just to also add on, on PETA. So I think it's time now to get, in, to get there. So answering the question, but answering also the other guys there. 
Thank you, Jean-Philippe, um, and thank you, thank you, Karen. Max, um, and you were talking earlier about this idea of these kind of potential for private sector collaboration, um, you know, making sure that they can do that in a way that allies to all the regulations and things like that. It's such a powerful concept of big corporations collaborating with small corporations, collaborating with the public sector, Collabor collaborating with academia, potentially even collaborating with citizens who have a vested interest in or particular subject matter expertise, because we've heard earlier about how individual citizens can have such power when you open things up in an open source way. Um, so can you maybe give us a little bit more around how do we make that happen faster and, and accelerate that whole trend? Yeah, may, maybe I give I give the example of the vehicle of the future initiative that we that we that we are supporting. So first, maybe to your point, I am not building a conglomerate here. I'm trying to get the competitors to work together on things that are not differentiating in a pre-competitive setup. So not a not not one company, not one conglomerate. Yeah. So just to, to be clear, and we w I would like to support that with community. Uh, driven platform building, so I don't want vendor lock-in or anything, but I want a community-driven platform where everybody can participate, driven by European actors, that's my role, I work for the European Commission, so I cannot say anything else, but I would not mind if also others adopt this platform from across the world, as long as I hope our companies stay leaders. So, so when I started this, we were, we were confronted with challenges in the automotive industry, which are still there. Transformation, need for more computing power. You can imagine an autonomous car doesn't work with the current processors in the car. So we have a disruption here. We see a shift towards new architectures. And on the hardware side, we have to reinvent what we do there. It comes on the market, but maybe not suited directly for the automotive industry, maybe not energy efficient enough, maybe too expensive, and we may have to just customize it. We see unsustainable costs by the suppliers in maintaining software. I think that's one of the big things. They are permanently adapting, upgrading, customizing, and wasting a lot of talents on that. The talent cannot go into innovation. They go into all these daily, daily work that they do. And we risk the dependence on non-EU companies, be it hardware companies, be, be it hyperscalers, or maybe in some way, be it, be it government-driven uh, establishments, whatever they are. And therefore, we see fierce competition in the different uh, regions of the world. And a year ago, I started to get all these companies around a table and said, can we not share more in a legal environment to overcome this fragmentation that everybody does it himself? There was investment of nearly 100 billion euros that they were claiming to put on STV. And I, I basically say, you can save a lot. I give no number by doing some things together pre-competitively. So we started this vehicle of the future initiative and in two strands, the SDV, software defined vehicle, that's the software part, and on, the, on, on working on an automotive hardware platform. And we have now the money in a way from the European Research and Innovation Funds, primarily the CHIPS joint undertaking. We have the money there, we have already some started and some are starting this year. So we get quite a lot of investment. And open source, I would say, is at the heart. Software, defined vehicle ecosystem, the building blocks are developed under open source, most of them, not all of them probably. There will be some on safety critical where they still have to uh, accept that they may be open source, that we are not there yet. And on the hardware, we work on RISC uh, the RISC V emerging ecosystem, so it's also open source. And we got, in, in, in the collaboration and, and the, the, that, that I've started, I, got, I get every four, three, four months, I get all the OEMs and all the tier ones around my table to discuss with them, to see what we can do in common, but, but always having in mind, they are competing on the market and I don't want to change that. That's not at all my goal. So we collaborate across the sector in pre-competitive setup, non-differentiating elements, vertically and horizontally. I think that's the important point. We see some of these projects in member states. They're vertical. One OEM, one or two suppliers, but it serves the companies primarily. Here we build the ecosystem, and I think the ecosystem is the approach. We follow a code-first approach, 
but we also try to take a holistic view. So by having all the companies think what we need together. And we scale, we gain agility, I think. We still have to prove it. And uh, we drive standards and reduce our lock-in. So in summary, I would say we reinforce Europe's leadership and preserve, I pick up the word sovereignty with, 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 with that. We, use, we better use financial resources of companies and we support the, uh, we, we, we also support talent building and not wasting talent. And the last point, we, I think we get the OEMs and the suppliers, the manufacturers and suppliers to compete more on the innovative features again, rather than wasting their time on customization and upgrading and waste their resources. Well, congratulations on that. It sounds like a very successful initiative in that area, in the autom automotive area. I'm assuming that provides a pattern for how we could do this across various different industries within Europe. Um, are you aware of similar um, initiatives in different industry verticals? In which area? In different, any, any other industry verticals that might be following a similar approach? Well, yes, I, I see that there are a lot of people thinking about that. We think ourselves, to get, uh, for example, with the energy industry or energy at the confluence of energy and e-mobility, where we are still working a lot in silos. So we, we think in the same direction. We also do a lot when we look at our research and innovation initiatives. So I could name three of them where we adopt this, uh, where we, where we adopt this approach. Before I do that, maybe a, a, quite of, a, a little bit of warning. We see that the research and innovation community in industry and research accepts and say, yeah, we do everything open source. They preach that a lot. But for some of the, them, it means they dump their code on GitHub and do nothing in community building. That will not help at all. That will not bring us, I think you have made similar statements before, and that's not enough. So we do this on all the work we do in Europe on cloud edge IoT, because we face the big hyperscaler. So we, 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 we have to find a way of getting our technologies, our knowledge in. We do the same for the uh, central piece of software in the cloud infrastructures and also on our future work on the next generation internet, where we have a thousand of, in the last five years, we had a thousand of small companies work, work together. So they are also open source is the predominant approach. So it sounds like loads of opportunity there. Um, Gail, do you want to come back in on that point? Yeah, no, the, that's, that's a very important point. We have been talking about that with Max for, for some time already, but uh, I mean, uh, so the, the, it has been some time since the uh, European Commission said, okay, you, you get uh, research money to, do op to, to develop your innovations and you should publish your innovations in open source, or at least a significant part of it in open source to, to improve dissemination. But I think that, uh, and uh, at the foundation, we have been participating in research projects for 10 years now. And, and I think that we, we really uh, work hard to helping researchers understand that it, it, they have to go further than just publishing their code. Like uh, in, our, in our workshop yesterday, somebody said that publishing the code is 1% of it. And well, that may be just a bit more than that, but uh, beyond publishing the code, there is all building the community, etc. And maybe just, uh, so improving the dissemination through open source uh, in, and finding better way to, to transform the money, uh, the research money in uh, open source platforms is, uh, is must be must be a priority. Um, but uh, one thing that I want to mention uh, about SDV is that uh, so we we have the part of what you describe happens at at the Eclipse Foundation under the SDV uh, working group, and I really much like the code first approach because that's that's something that is new for the automotive industry, and what is what is super important is that we we reach a critical mass. Thanks to your uh, your your group and um, and all of that, it's it's about reaching a critical mass because when you think about it and and the competitive advantage is that an hyperscaler can create a project on their own. They have, they have the they and 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 create and build a community around the around the project. I think that uh, the the European industry really need to group 
to align their goals to, to create a big enough project that, that get uh, enough traction. So get good at this collaboration stuff, is what you're saying. Yeah, okay. So, so that's a good goal for all of us, I think. I do want to comment one thing about the, about the ask of researchers to start to do more and build community. And it's not only, I think, a skills problem, but back to that comment earlier about what do we ask volunteers in the same way. I mean, it's a big ask to ask a researcher who has never done this before and is busy doing research to actually build community. So perhaps it's another opportunity for us to look at different mechanisms by which we can enable that with in that community because we can't just lump it in on top of everything else they have to do I guess um, but, but that's, that's just a, a comment from, from how, how we can enable this lots, lots of challenges that we can all work out together um, but we're here to do that and I think this is a wonderful uh, start to that conversation so I'm going to ask one final question as we move towards the next uh, break I think um, and that is one of my favourite questions if you and we'll do this very short because I know Paula is here, here uh, telling us that we'll, we'll have to wrap up soon but if, if you had a magic wand and you could wave it and you could have a wish tomorrow one thing one thing that you could just make happen with a magic wave of a wand what would it be peter i already said it okay repeat uh, it, please <laughs> every 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 public procurement must require open source software not just if the public is creating software also, if they buy off-the-shelf software, we must come to that point. Not, I understand that this is not possible tomorrow, but if we put out a policy and, and say we, will, we want to be there in, let's say, five or ten years, huge investments in open source will happen from the European economy. Thank you, Peter. Jean-Philippe. Thank you, Peter. Jean-Philippe, wave your wand. Mine, mine is a consequence of Peter's one, somehow. <laughs> we'll have to do these in order, you know. <laughs> you, oh. Uh, I'd, I'd love that we would have um, champions in open source for doing large projects in different regions of our wonderful continents that would gather resources from all over the continents to nurture the communities, to grow the people, grow the talent, create jobs in Europe as well, uh, and uh, show some leadership, and that was mentioned by Mike uh, as a statement, show some leadership as well uh, beyond Europe. And that was really interesting, sorry, it's a long answer, but the UN uh, uh, talks in this, this morning are very inspiring for us. And I think we're trying to do things for good as well, even though we're private companies, we have other stakes, right? But if I have this magic wand, this is what I would do. Thank you, Jean-Philippe. Karen? Well, I would like us to start getting European companies to collaborate before their, their sort of uh, time of, of of grandeur is gone. Uh, I mean, now we've been talking a lot about the vehicle industry in Europe, but I mean, in the news, they're saying, well, the German car companies are shutting more and more down, and it's other places in the world where the car industry is doing well. So I think it's a little bit a talk about how do we save a, uh, an industry that's going down rather than how do we make sure that we will have the innovative industries in Europe and not being ca playing catch up, because this is all a lot of creating European champions. And I mean, Bo Boeing and Airbus are the two big airplane companies in the world because the US and the EU decided to pour in money and uh, pour in protectionism over them to protect them. And I think this is not really the way to go unless you're France or Germany and have big influence in the European Commission. If you want to have the small member states, innovators all over Europe to actually be driving innovation, you need a different approach than let's choose our champions and pour money into them. We need to have an open source act, I would say. We need to have a piece of legislation supporting uh, open source development. And just as we've had an AI act, a DSA and a DMA that actually started as one idea, um, then I think we need to have a vision from the European Commission when they start sometime in 2025 after the Hungarian presidency of how to encourage open source development and community in Europe. And mentioning the, the work of researchers, I mean, we are 
bothering them with so much red tape to get EU funding that they're not actually spending most of their time researching, they're spending most of the time trying to get research so that they can keep their temporary job and perhaps get a permanent one in the universities of Europe because it's so difficult to get funding. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I 100% agree with you that you say it's better to address industry and solve the problem before it has become a real problem. Nevertheless, better late than never, So, because Europe, I think, cannot afford to lose this industry, so at least we are now not throwing money at something which is the past. We are trying to throw money at, at something that unites them. So we are not using the famous Gieskan principle to give money to everything, but we, we try to concentrate on if you master the SDV, then you master the digital components in the car. So if we get you back on that, then we may get you back on other things. So I would say I agree, but nevertheless. So on your point now, One wish, please. Short one. <laughs> on your point now, I, I think on the industrial side, we still have to provide really convincing proof of concept. So one of my goals in this initiative is to rather quickly show that we will the, get the use of secure and stable open source with automotive grade in comp company specific systems, yeah, so that they use it and that we can, we can say that and because then we, then we are successful and that will also help us to get to the CEOs, not only in automotive, other companies. If we don't convince them, we, 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 we will not get there. If we only have the evangelists in the companies, we, we are getting beyond them, but that's really what we have started with. So I think that's extremely important to get to that, that level. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Max. Gail, a yeah, very so quick wish. Very short. <laughs> so my, my wish, if I have a magic uh, one, is uh, use uh, open source to align the efforts beyond the member state politics and uh, or cultural differences. So that's more, that was mentioned this morning by Omar, uh, that uh, make open source our common European language. And well, of course, globally after being European language. Thank you, thank you, Gael. And thank you to all our panelists for this lively discussion. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you all for listening. Um, I hope all the wishes come true. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>